And I'm Dinda Elliott, the Director of Programs at China Institute, and welcome to Pieces of China, which is a bite-sized, a series of bite-sized programs that tell the story of China one object at a time. And today we are so honored to have Ron, Ronald Knapp, who is one of the world's leading experts on traditional Chinese architecture. Uh, and for, for more than four decades, Ron has traveled all across China to document its rapidly disappearing old houses. He has authored and edited more than 20 books on vernacular Chinese architecture. They are, many of them are beautiful coffee table books, I will tell you, and I highly re recommend that you go and, go and buy them right now. Um, Ron's newest book is about Chinese covered bridges, and so he's going to talk about one bridge that he particularly loves. So Ron, welcome. We're so glad you were able to join us. Um, I see the bridge is there. Is there a way you can um, share full screen? Yeah, exactly. Click yes, on the I'm screen. in the process of doing that. Beautiful. You and, can see it now. Yeah, beautiful. So Ron, my first question for you is why, you know, why did you choose this particular covered bridge? Okay, I mean, this is a complicated story. My interest has always been in Chinese villages and I've documented, seen hundreds of villages, lots of houses, but it wasn't until 1987 that I first saw a covered bridge in China after literally being at uh, scores hundreds of uh, villages. That particular bridge, as impressive as it was, didn't really start my journey. My journey really started about 15 years ago to understand covered bridges in China. And uh, since then, over the last 15 years, I've literally traveled all over China documenting bridges as we learned about bridges and even places that we had not read about before. I visited this bridge first in 2006, and this particular picture is a picture that I took actually last fall in 2019. This is the fourth time I've been to this village. Uh, this village was really quite remote, and uh, even though I got there in 2006, it was uh, in a rutted single track road over the mountains. The mountainous areas of southern Zhejiang, northern Fujian are very, 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 very rugged. Uh, subsequently, it's gotten much easier to get there. But I'd like to start with this particular slide. Some of you, why is that not going? There we are here. Some of you may not even think about covered bridges in general. I mean, America has a great tradition of covered bridges. Europe has a great tradition of covered bridges, but until recent years, very few people in China, let alone people outside of China, knew anything about covered bridges. The Chinese have established through archeological work that there was a covered bridge in China 2000 years ago. And these are the remnants in Sichuan province. Since then, we've come to know that China actually had and has had more covered bridges than are found in the United States in North America or in, in Europe. There's a great tradition really uh, of covered bridges, even though we don't know a great deal about them yet. Now, again, my screen is not going as quickly as it, there we go here. Now, what it is about this bridge? What is most significant about this bridge is that it is quintessentially Chinese in terms of its arch architecture, its interior characteristics, as well as its exterior characteristics. Here we see a style, which, a style of construction we can see all over Southern China in houses and temples and the like. And even when you look in detail inside, you see beautiful dogong. And these dogong are exquisite. No one, none of the architects, none of the engineers who have looked at these in this in bridges actually has examined these very closely. It's for what somebody- is it, yeah. what, is it, what is a dogong? A uh, dogong is a bracket set. And that's what we can see on the, uh, on the side here. And for those of you who are listening in, Dinda and I are going to have a conversation. She's going to be asking me questions to prompt <laughs> me along. But this is an exquisite bridge. And it's a bridge that clearly is dated to 1625. And it's 1625 on the basis of an inscription on a pole, which is uh, the ridge pole on the bridge. We don't know what bridge existed there before 1625, but we know that this is a bridge from 1625. It's been looked at very, very carefully, and this bridge has not been 
destroyed, even though it's been renovated a number of times since. It is clearly a 1625 bridge. Now, aside from what you see in the corridor above, if you look beneath this bridge, you see a very interesting structure. And it's a structure that we really didn't even know existed in bridges in, in, in this area of China uh, until about 30, 30 years ago. And what architects found out really quite clearly is that this form mimics what was found in the 11th to 12th uh, century Qingming Shanghe tool that uh, Fred Merck talked about uh, a, couple, a couple months ago. But this is a so-called woven timber arch bridge, really extraordinary. Uh, it was found in Fujian and Zhejiang province uh, uh, about 30 years ago, and then it was for, forgotten about, and now it's been rediscovered. And literally, there are scores of bridges with this kind of a woven arch structure. Now, Dinda. So yeah, so I wanted to ask you, do you love these covered bridges also because they have an important function in rural life or tell us a little bit about what they're what they were used for or what they That's are? A very, it's a very good question. As any architectural historian, art historian knows, there was a time when uh, people who looked at objects, at pieces, they looked at them as separate from the society in which they emerged or the society of perhaps in which they live. But bridges in, in China, covered bridges in, in China that are generally called Langqiao, corridor bridges or Feng Yuqiao, that these are used as social spaces. In fact, some of the reasons for their construction has as much to do with social spaces as it does to providing a passage from one bank to another bank. Uh, I don't have um, many pictures of these in the county or the town where we find the Rulong Bridge, but I've been to enough bridges and have enough pictures that I can see the use of these as social spaces as we can see here. We can see also that in many villages, these serve as market stalls uh, on a regu regular basis. We can see here that on a market day, somebody is in the, in, in the, in the bridge in effect, serving up food for people who, who, are, who are coming. We can see that people come into these bridges to buy and sell and sell goods. And these are only just a few examples uh, of these. Another thing that's characteristic of Chinese bridges is that they also serve as religious spaces, almost without exception, that one finds, as we can see on the left-hand side here, an active shrine. This is a photo I took in a bridge in in this town, uh, in this village in 2006, of a woman passing through the bridge with her grandchild, in effect, uh, uh, paying obeisance, uh, obeisance to, uh, to Guanyin. In some bridges, the shrine is actually up top. It's a second story, a full-size temple up above. In other cases, as we can see on the right side, uh, the, the shrine is on the outside. This is more likely today on the outside because of the fear of fire. And so some of these shrines have been moved from inside to outside as we can see, as we can see there. Inda. Just absolutely so gorgeous to look. I could look at these images forever. Um, so yeah, so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how these, these um, bridges connected in life and what was their function? Historically. You begin to see this actually once you get to the bridge and sometimes, uh, especially 10, 15 years ago, you had to walk a great distance uh, to get to a bridge and you usually approached it by a path and you can see some of these paths that are there. And these are relatively small paths, stone line paths that lead to what is a fairly large bridge. And as you begin to look at these more carefully, you begin to see that many of these bridges exist as nodes in networks, that there were trading networks in many of these uh, villages that tied many of these villages to other villages and ultimately to towns and even to metropolitan, metropolitan spaces. Sometimes you can see with a couple images that I have here, you can see people even today using these stone line paths, using these bridges in effect to access what you can find up in the hills. But when you dig a little deeper historically, you begin to see that this particular bridge, this particular village, has a long history of use. And this is a Ming Dynasty bridge, probably 
early in the Ming Dynasty uh, than what we see with it with it today. And what's quite interesting, if you get into this county, you find out that this county uh, during the Ming Dynasty was famous for shiitake mushrooms. I had no idea really about this until 2011 when when I visited uh, Qingyuan County and found that near the Covered Bridge Museum, I'll show you a picture of that, there also was a mushroom museum. I can't imagine going to a mushroom museum, but in that museum, it pointed out that the mushrooms from this county, which they say originated in this county, then were transported all over China. And it was hard to find pictures of this, but here I was able to find in the Bristol archives here of porters carrying mushrooms in Fujian from Yongchun County around 1910. Now they were carrying them from small villages to larger towns and ultimately to the metropolitan areas. But they, these were porters, these were porters going over the mountains on the uh, stone brick or, or, or stone slab uh, the roots literally to move the mushrooms that were intrinsic to this particular area. Now, when you look elsewhere in China, for example, you'll see here in Southwest China, uh, I first went to uh, Yunnan province. I think it was uh, about uh, 1990, something. I wasn't particularly interested in minority culture and the like, uh, but I've been back there now four or five times over the last decade. And I've come to learn the significance of Yunnan province and also Sichuan province in the so-called tea horse road. The movement of tea, brick tea, from these provinces up to Tibet, which were exchanged for horses or ponies and brought back, back to China. And we have some great photos that missionaries took adventurers took from the 19th century that showed the carrying of these bricks bricks of tea uh, along the course up to the Tibetan plateau. And while there is, you can find pictures of one of these porters carrying them across a suspension bridge, I don't have a picture of them carrying them through a corridor bridge. Uh, they often would carry them to another launch site, just like the, the Pony Express, for example, where they would be offloaded to another porter who would carry them a longer distance, or they would be put on the backs of yaks or mules and the like uh, to go another, another part of the route. So this was a significant uh, aspect of these routes, these networks, and the covered bridges, not only in Yunnan, but also in other provinces. Here on the right-hand side, we can see in Yunnan province and Sichuan today, not so much moving tea, because tea today is principally moved in trucks, but it ha often has to be moved from upland areas down to the roads, you know, by porters or carried by mules. So, so we're pressing, these, pressing up against time. I'm just wondering if we can jump forward to the question of feng shui and the role that the uh, bridge... I'm going to go right to feng shui right now. This Beautiful. particular village is a, an incredible village as far as feng shui is concerned. 2006, some of the outlines of it were obvious, but it was not talked about. Here's a 19th century view of the village that shows the hills behind and the uh, uh, the stream uh, in front. And here's a view literally from Google Maps, which shows it at the same time, having this characteristic of well-designed feng shui landscapes with mountains behind and streams in front. And if you move forward with this, you realize how significant the bridges were in the feng shui landscape. The feng shui landscape was not simply uh, a function of the natural landscape. It was the sculpted aspects that were added by man. In this particular village, upstream was the Lifeung, the arriving Phoenix bridge. And downstream was the bridge we're talking about today, the Rulong, like a dragon bridge. So the Phoenix and the dragon, which are very sy symbolic in China, are quite significant, uh, as well as right now, we can see three other bridges that are there. Five bridges are missing in this composition, but very clearly in certainly in late Ming, this composition uh, involved the covered bridges. And what was the feng shui, feng shui you know, meaning or significance? Well, the feng shui, the feng shui meaning here of, of the bridges was to contain the wealth, to keep the wealth 
of to mark the wealth of the um, in the village and to keep it within the village, a kind of a barrier on both both ends. And this is well documented in other other villages, which I've seen individually. But in this particular village, you see several components operating simultaneously. Wow. Now, some of these elements, traditional elements, are missing from this particular bridge. Uh, for example, if you go in the bridge today, you see the shrine is empty, even though there are hundreds, thousands of bridges in China that have shrines. The reason this one is, is empty is because this bridge uh, was nationally listed in 1997 as a, uh, as a memorial site and things like shrines were removed. Well, here's where I wanted to jump in and ask you actually, if we could maybe jump, well, maybe this is the, this is the right image for it, but, but to talk a little bit about what happened. So the shrines, the feng shui, all that stuff must have come under attack during the Cultural Revolution. What, you know, what happened to all this stuff? Did it just kind of disappear? It's, uh, that's really quite interesting. Uh, I've been to so many, so many villages uh, where you can see the destruction from the, the Cultural Revolution, the apparent destruction, not only the destruction of shrines, but also the, removement of, of the removal of, uh, uh, of signs that related to the Cultural Revolution. Some of them are faded. It's quite interesting in this village in 2019, last fall when I visited, for the first time, I went into this hall. And this hall at above says Mao Jushi Wan Sui, long live Chairman Mao. These were common in villages in the past, these, these halls. I hadn't seen many of these uh, recently, but I've seen them in a couple other villages in uh, Qingyuan County. But when I went inside, and we were inside for a conference, actually, on the back wall were five images, uh, Marx, Lenin, Engels, Stalin, and Chairman Mao in the, in the middle. Now, I had seen scores of these in the 1980s, the 1990s, but they had disappeared. Yeah. Here in the fall of 2019, I go into a hall and oh, they're in your face in, you the, in the back, all brightly, all brightly lit. What that oh. means, what happened in the intervening years, I don't, I don't know. But yeah. the fact that they are in this village so uh, indicates something. Yeah. So again, uh, we're pressed for time. And so I wanted to jump ahead to what happened during the years of reform and opening up. Was this village essentially bypassed by that, um, you know, the several decades of modernization until more recently? Uh, yes, in many respects. But uh, there are villages, there are counties that are ahead or uh, were ahead of others. This because it was a remote county a remote village in a remote county did not open early, but it began to learn from the experiences of other counties and villages. In 2011, actually I was in, in Qingyan County in 2011 when this museum opened. This was a covered bridge museum that opened. It was quite surprising. I had not seen a covered bridge museum elsewhere in China. It indicated that it was beginning to make a claim about this particular county being a kingdom of covered bridges. Right. Indeed, there are 97 covered bridges in this county, more than in any county in China. Uh -huh. This is now it, known. It wrapped, wrapped within that, there's an economic strategy to develop the region through tourism, right? So talk a little bit it's, about that. It clearly is. By 2014, they put lights on this bridge. Well, we beautiful. can see it. And this was to encourage folks who were staying there to come out at night, to wander, to eat, to drink, and the like. The promotion of tourism uh, became a big thing in this particular this particular village. This is the main street uh, in the village. Uh, all of those banners and the like that you see, most of them are B&Bs that are open for business. Uh, this is not my shot, but this is an internet shot of a large group that was there that had a banquet in the middle in the middle of the the street. In so the, the village, village today, there are bilingual the signs. Pardon me? The village is being reborn. The village is, is being reborn. And this is all happening at the same time that the, uh, the, the, the uh, traffic infrastructure in the counties has become well developed. So the place is actually much, much more accessible. And you can find from 2015 down to the present, many articles in Chinese as well as English enticing visitors 
to come by road in their private cars or come by come by train and take a bus or even come by plane and take a car a taxi and get here and have to just again to jump forward through these images um have the feng shui traditions returned well i have not seen in this village the building of new covered bridges uh, these, however, are happening both in Fujian province and, and Jinjiang province regularly. And there are some pictures that show these practices uh, occurring. And they're occurring in many villages that want a signature structure, a covered, a covered bridge. This, on the left-hand side, we can see the ritual involved in the selecting of the ridge pole uh, for the bridge. On the right-hand side, we can see the building of, the, uh, of, a, of a covered bridge. Uh, here, these are, again, these are not my pictures. These are pictures by a friend, uh, Liu Yan, who has documented very, very well mm -hmm. all of the ritual involved in the building of a particular particular bridge. Wow, uh, so what you see here is Taoist priests? Is that what we're seeing? That's here? right. There are Dao, Dao, Taoist priests, feng shui masters, all, all involved, as well as many artifacts and animal sacrifices and the like that are involved. This is a living culture. Yes. in this particular area of China. I, as I said, I have not seen it in Qingyuan County. Uh, they're not so concerned about building new bridges. They already have more covered bridges than are found anywhere in China. Amazing, amazing. So you see, you know, what you've just done is so incredible because you have shown how, you know, through a bridge, you really have told the story of China. I mean, it's all the way from the Ming Dynasty, uh, you know, prosperity, and then falling behind and ex enduring poverty uh, and things being, traditions being wiped out. And now the traditions are returning and you see prosperity again. It's, it's an amazing, amazing. And actually, I put up the cover of the new book, which is also part of uh, current history. Yeah. Uh, this book was published in China uh, last September, just in time for a uh, a launch and an opening uh, there uh, by Shanghai Jiao Tong University Press. It's a almost a 500 page 500 page book. It wow. was it was supposed to come very quickly to North America, but uh, our president's uh, 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 difficulties with trade with China blocked it from coming out. And finally, through arrangements with University of Hawaii Press, University of Hawaii Press took the plates, produced it here in the United States, and is now marketing it in the United That's States with a different color cover. Yep. And I was able to put this particular bridge on the cover. Beautiful. And we put we posted the um the link there onto our chat as well earlier. So that's great. Well, Ron, I want to thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. 